Are you confused about what the term self-care even means? Have you asked yourself, I've been reading all these things about how parents need to avoid burnout by engaging in self-care, but what self-care? Am I doing it right? Which is such a post-traumatic parenting thought. Am I self-caring enough? I still feel burned out. The self-care isn't working. What is self-care anyway? Hi, I'm Dr. Robin Koslowitz. YouTube's post-traumatic parenting expert. Today, we're gonna to talk about self-care, the types of self-care, what it is, and most crucially, what it most definitely is not, and how to know the difference. But first, if you like this topic, if you're a post-traumatic parent who wants to engage in self-care, who thinks self-care sounds kinda loose, who doesn't understand how to do self-care, welcome please click subscribe below so you never miss another episode. And let's dive right into the concept. What is self-care? So first of all, so the scented candles and the luxurious body soap and maybe the, here's my like little weighted blanket. Are these things self-care? I feel like a lot of products are marketed to us post-traumatic parents as self-care, but what does self-care even mean? And I think one of the worst things about the way self-care is talked about right now is it almost becomes another way to make parents feel bad. It becomes another kind of parent blaming theory where you know why you're so burnt out? I didn't engage in enough self-care. Just buy my mindfulness journal for $19.99 and then you will have self-care and then you won't have any reason why you're snapping at your kids. So if this is frustrating for you, if you're wondering about the concept of self-care, let's talk about it. Let's understand how self-care works and the components of it. So first of all, I think for most of us, this idea of self-care is very much confused with other concepts. So I like to break down what people think of as self-care into three separate components. I wrote a blog post about this on Psychology Today a really long time ago, and if you want to know about that blog post, let me know in the comments below and I'll send you the link to it. Um, it's the first time I ever saw this concept broken down. The way self-care works is, there is self-care, which we'll deal with in a second. There's self-maintenance and there's anesthesia. And these are three completely different things. Self-care restores our sense of self and helps remind us who we are. It's a joy experience. Self-maintenance is what we do to maintain our body. It is super important, but it's not self-care. And then there's anesthesia. Anesthesia is what we do to get through stressful moments in life, but it's not self-maintenance or self-care. We need all three in order to parent and restore ourselves as parents, but they're not the same thing. So let's first understand what anesthesia is. So you know when you see these, um, you know when you see these memes and it's like, I drink wine so that I can deal with my kids whining, or you know, Netflix and chill after all day with my kids. Or, you know, when people talk about, um, you know, scrolling Instagram or um, shopping a lot after their kid's bedtime, and that's my self-care of the day, that's not your self-care. That has nothing to do with who you are as a unique human. That has nothing to do with restoring your sense of self and joy. That has to do with lowering some of the adrenaline and cortisol and stress response that being a parent being a parent in a post-pandemic world, and for sure being a post-traumatic parent in genders, because parenting is hard, stressful, lonely, difficult work. It is always going to be hard, stressful, lonely, difficult work. Even with all the gentle, conscious parenting responsiveness in the world, even when we're trying really hard, even when we do parenting really, really, really well, you have a day where your kid had a meltdown and it didn't phase you and you helped her deal with her big emotions and everybody ate their dinner and you had a dentist appointment, but you handled your kid's fear about it. And the teacher called and said something a little challenging about your son and you talked him through it. 
you had a day where you did all the parenting stuff right. Mr. Rogers and, you know, Mary Poppins sort of rolled into one, had nothing on you as a parent. Guess what? That was a stressful day. You did it all right, and it depleted you, as it should, because any work depletes us. Working hard, especially for something so valuable as parenting, all day long, even if everything went right and you handled everything tip-top, in fact, especially if you handled everything really well, it's going to deplete you. And after the kids go to bed, you're like, all right, I need to get through the next, like, I sort of need to just take a load off and restore myself and get myself back into my own mode. So what I'm going to do is watch this really funny, slightly, you know, brain candy, dumb show that I like to watch completely because doing that while eating a snack just lowers the adrenaline and cortisol that this really hard day gave me and then i can transition into my evening and some alone time and some me time that's anesthesia and that is totally fine in tiny small doses anesthesia to take the edge off if you know your kids are going to all come tumbling into your house in, the, in 15 minutes full of all their needs and demands and wants and as loving as you are of them, their exuberance can be exhausting and you got to give supper and get people to practice and get people to do their homework and the whole bedtime routine. And you have 15 minutes, you came home from work and you're like, all right, I am going to spend 15 minutes drinking a cup of my favorite beverage. Like I'm going to drink my tea or my coffee or my hot cocoa. And I'm going to read this, you know, completely, completely mindless and meaningless magazine. Or I'm going to scroll through Instagram. Or I'm going to watch funny cat videos for a while. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do something just to like take the edge off. You're doing anesthesia right then and there. Now, exercise can be something else. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in that moment, you're, an, you're anesthetizing yourself. You're just like transitioning and taking a load off in order to get yourself into a better frame of mind for later. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. I wouldn't want to undergo surgery without anesthesia. There's nothing wrong with saying, I need a little anesthesia. And even if you need a little anesthesia every single day to get through stressful times, Sometimes you're in that dentist's office waiting room and it's just anxiety provoking and there's a lot of screaming kids and your kid is getting edgy and everything is just like there's so much going on and then your friend texts you this really funny meme and you text her one back and that anesthesia gets you through the moment and that little chuckle that you have gets you through that moment and then you can handle the stress and the hassle of the dentist visit with equanimity of spirit. That's anesthesia, and that's great. And we all need some anesthesia. But if your self-care plan is a cup of wine and an hour of Netflix every night, that's anesthesia. That's not actually restoring your sense of self. It's just numbing the pain, getting rid of some of the adrenaline and cortisol so that you can deal with tomorrow or transition yourself into bedtime or whatever that is. That's not self-care. So if that's your self-care plan, chatting with your friend on the phone while cooking dinner and hectically searching for the lost shoe and, you know, the missing homework math paper, that's anesthesia. Chatting with your friend on the phone is how you get through the stress of looking for the lost left shoe, right? That's what that's for. That's not your self-care. Something else entirely. Anesthesia is something that dulls the anxiety, pain, adrenaline, cortisol, stress of the difficult moment to get through it without exploding so that we can then do other things. That's one thing. Then we have self-maintenance. Self-maintenance are the things we do to keep our body healthy. When you eat your quinoa salad for lunch, when you brush your teeth, when you take a shower, when you use a chamomile scented body wash in the shower to help your body transition into sleep, when you light that scented candle in your bathroom to give you a little mood boost, that's not self-care. So many people, I, there are so many products. If you go onto Amazon and you look for products tagged as self-care, almost all of them are self-maintenance products. 
you're going to find weighted blankets, you're going to find eye masks and sleep masks, you're going to find massagers, you're going to find body lotions, you're going to find scented candles. All of those are lovely things and they're wonderful for self-maintenance. Our bodies do need to be maintained. You do need to take a shower. You do need to eat healthy food. You do need to get enough sleep. You do need to meditate to, to deal with your mental health. Right? All of those are wonderful. And all of those are about self-maintenance. I mean, meditation can be a little different. We'll get to self-care in a moment. But you need to do those practices that make your body healthy. When you're going to the gym because you need to get a certain amount of reps of an exercise in and you want to get a certain amount of cardio in because that's in your healthy maintenance of my body to keep my body healthy enough so that I can, so it can help me do the things I need to do with my family and with my life. You might even get that post-exercise glow and it feels great, but it's self-maintenance. It's good for your body. Now, what's self-care? Self-care are engaging in those experiences that make you feel the most like you, that feel like joy, that feel like delight, feel like something I truly want to do from the, from the highest essence of who I am. Now, sometimes a self-maintenance activity can be self-care. For example, meditation. If meditation gets you in touch with yourself and who you truly are, if when you run, you, you get to be alone with your thoughts and remind yourself of who you really are, then that run is both self-care and self-maintenance. I had that experience once where um, I, was, I was working out at a certain gym and I was with a group of my friends. We were working out together and it was classes that I really liked and I really enjoyed. And I, was, I felt the most me when I was doing, when I was there. That was my self-care. And then that, that gym closed down and schedules changed. And I still felt the need for self-maintenance. I wanted to get my workout in. So I went to different classes, not with friends, simply to maintain my body. But I wasn't getting that same joy and sense of self from it. And suddenly what had been self-care going to the gym. So suddenly I needed to find time for self-care that was separate from my time for self-maintenance. Self-care might be getting together with friends if getting together with friends increases your energy levels and makes you feel most like yourself. Now, here's the thing. I, by nature, am an, am an introvert. And I think there's something very important to think about with self-care. Not always does self-care leave you feeling rested and rejuvenated. Self-maintenance might. But self-care doesn't always. So I might get together with friends. And I, I, I recently had this. I went to a party where a lot of my friends were. And it was really fun. It was really stimulating. I was so excited to see everyone. I had a great time. I really felt like myself. It was fantastic. And then I needed to recover afterwards because although it was self-care, it restored my sense of self and who I am and who I want to be in the world. It also, because I am an introvert, was depleting. So then I needed to do some self-maintenance, you know, to take a bubble bath, to go to bed early, to do things to lower adrenaline levels and take care of my body. And yeah, some of that was anesthesia, like listening to a funny podcast in the bubble bath so I could lower my adrenaline, make my body feel restored because the self-care experience depleted me. The idea that self-care is going to leave you feeling refreshed and rejuvenated is one of the reasons why people mix up self-maintenance and self-care. You might do something self-care. You might go on some spiritual retreat and it's exhilarating. It really makes you feel like exactly who you are and gets you back in touch with your values. And then you're tired afterwards. I was recently talking to a post-traumatic parent who said that she finds taking a post-traumatic parenting class to be self-care, but it's also depleting. It's self-care because it puts her in touch with her values of who she wants to be. And she's amongst like-minded people who are on the same journey as her but it's depleting because it's reminding her of her childhood traumas and it's a journey it's a worthwhile difficult journey of self-discovery and she finds that what she has to do is she takes the class and then she journals for a while and the journaling is if you think about it 
a combination of self-care and self-maintenance because as she journals, she's taking some distressing thoughts out of her brain, self-maintenance, and then she's writing about her aspirations towards her highest self, self-care, and she's understanding her journey. So it's so confusing the way in which self-care, self-maintenance, anesthesia are working together. I will tell you right now that there are times that I exercise completely and totally from a place of anesthesia. I actually have a, um, a t-shirt for the gym that shows a heavy bang. The heavy bang goes straight down and it says, I hit this so I won't hit you. And it's obviously one of these snarky mom t-shirts about how, you know, punching the heavy bag gets my aggression out and then I don't have to hit, you know, all the annoying people in my life. And there are a lot. Um, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I have a really stressful, perhaps I have a session with a patient and there's a lot in my brain. And first I just need to dull it. I need it to go away because I'm carrying too much and I'll go run on the treadmill at a really high speed or I'll go hit a heavy bag. And for a while it's anesthesia because I just need to numb it. And then it slowly transitions to self-maintenance. So first I'm just numbing those feelings. I need to get them out. I need to just like run off the adrenaline. Anesthesia. And maybe if I do that while watching something funny, even more so anesthesia. Then at some point it's like, okay, now I'm gonna finish this run at a much more sensible and sustainable pace because I do value my body. And actually, if I kept on running at the level of keeping an anesthesia, I would injure myself because my body is not designed to run at that speed for that long whenever I do, whenever I try to you know, run that fast for that long. So it really works as an anesthetic. I end up injuring myself, right? Because I'm ignoring some of the signals my body is sending me. My knees are like, stop running right now. But I need that anesthetic, so I keep running which is a very post-traumatic, um, stre- sort of post-traumatic stress symptomatology, right? I-, I need to get this adrenaline out of my brain right now, but my body is not handling the way I'm doing that. It's significantly better than drinking. It's significantly better than self-harming, right? Those are, it is so much better than both of those things. And yet, at the same token, It's anesthesia and just like real anesthesia, like, you know, in the emergency room, when they give you some anesthetic to numb you, you can do too much anesthesia and then that can be really dangerous, right? So I firmly suggest if you're a post-traumatic person and your anesthesia experiences are getting out of hand, it's really worthwhile to set some checks and balances on them, right? Put the cork back in the wine bottle. I'm going to have a glass of wine and then I'm going to put the bottle away and that's it. I'm not having more. If I'm st- if it didn't quite hit the spot, I'll, I'll I'll go to chocolate now, right? Same thing with like Netflix and chill. I'm gonna set a timer, and when that timer beeps, I'm going to bed, even if I could seriously watch another three hours of reality people doing unrealistic scripted things, but pretending that it's actually their life, and you know, pulling each other's hair and yelling at each other. And you know what? There's so much of that content. I could like watch this all night, except I need sleep. So sure, if watching funny cats pretend to talk to each other floats your boat, if watching a cartoon from the 80s floats your boat, if watching reality fake people doing fake real things floats your boat, whatever that anesthesia is, uh, maybe it's listening to Vivaldi while eating chocolate, I don't know, whatever that is, set a timer, okay? Like my, give, literally what we do with kids, give yourself a bedtime and shut it off. And there are actually apps that will just shut Netflix in the middle of an episode if you can't do it for yourself. Why can't you do it for yourself? And that's where PTSD comes in. Because when you have a lot of post-traumatic stress symptomatology, it's really hard to turn the anesthesia off because the trauma app in our brain is like, no, 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 I finally feel safe and comfortable. Don't, don't, don't. The minute you turn that show off, reality is gonna come flooding back in. And I don't like reality. So let's, let's stay in like this fake island where fake people are fake proposing to each other, right? Or let's stay watching these funny cats or let's watch the Jetsons, right? Because then we can pretend that the world is safe and everything's fine. The trauma app wants you to do that. So I really suggest setting checks and balances. There's nothing wrong with anesthesia as long as you don't let the anesthesia get out of hand. Now with self-maintenance, same thing. What happens to post-traumatic stress 
people, what happens to post-traumatic parents, but really any post-traumatic person, when we get involved in self-maintenance and we start getting back in touch with our body, because trauma, of course, really divorces us from our bodies. And our body is just a source of uncomfortable sensations that we need to shut off and control and manage all the time. So what do we, so, so what happens when we start getting back in touch with our bodies is sometimes what we need to do is discipline our bodies because like, now I'm going to teach my body exactly what it is and is not allowed to do. It's a, it's a post-traumatic way of bringing some semblance of order and control to this body that used to be terribly threatening, but now I'm sort of trying to befriend, but I'm going to do that in a slightly unhealthy way. And what happens to a lot of post-traumatic people when they start getting back in touch with their bodies is they start getting very overly disciplined about getting in touch with their bodies. Why? And I will say there, but I mean our, because I have certainly done this. Why? Because the body is really scary. It's the source of all these uncomfortable emotions and all these uncomfortable sensations. So let me discipline it. I'll befriend it, but it's going to be a very, it's going to be a very boundary friendship where I'm in charge and, and the body is subjugated to me. When that happens, that's where we get like really, really, really hung up on like a certain eating plan, a certain diet plan, a certain exercise plan, a certain sleep plan. That's where like all the lifestyle gurus really get their say in our lives. And we, we can overdo that. And we want to always do things with balance. So if you're getting like, I need to wake up at 5 a.m. and go for my morning run every single day like this guy on YouTube says I should because that's how to hustle and be a successful whatever. But like the night before your kid woke up three times in the middle of the night, maybe that's not the morning for the 5 a.m. run. And if you're panicking about that, then your self-maintenance is taking over and becoming unhealthy. And when that happens, that's not a good thing. It's sometimes a necessary stage between I hate my body. It's just the source of everything uncomfortable and I want it to go away, which, you know, is illogical, but happens with post-traumatic stress disorder to, well, I, I want to talk to my body, but it better listen to exactly what I tell it to do, to me and my body are friends, and we work together, and I have figured out a way to hear what my body is saying and to handle what my body wants while also getting to the values that I want. And I, my body and I have reached a really healthy place where we have a good relationship with each other. There are stages. And then finally, self-care. Nobody gets to tell you what is and isn't self-care. And self-care doesn't always in the moment feel good. Like I said, that party with my friends felt wonderful in the moment, but it depleted me. In the moment, it might feel good, but afterwards it might deplete you. That's okay. If you're a super creative person and you go to an art studio to paint, you're, you're super, super concentrating while you're painting and you're your you're, you're most selfless you are your most within self you are your you are yourself so much right now like you're having that real self experience and you might be tired afterwards because that takes a lot out of you so don't expect self-care to rejuvenate you we have this idea that self-care is like going to some four million dollar spa and 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 having a million scented candles and eye masks and cucumber wraps and seaweed wraps and massages and that might be that might be self-care for some people that might make them feel the most like themselves but it's probably more self-maintenance you're probably going to feel great afterwards i'm sure after a you know seaweed wrap and whatever and then a massage and then a mud bath and whatever you, your body feels glowing and wonderful and so we it makes sense that we confuse the two that self that self-maintenance and self-care we assume self-care will feel like self-maintenance it won't self-care is what not always sometimes it might but usually Self-care is just what makes me feel like me. And no one gets to tell you what self-care is. If cuddling your baby sometimes feels like self-care, then it's self-care. If organizing a closet because you really love the aesthetics of, of, of balancing all the elements in the closet and that just makes you your artistic side feel fulfilled, that feels like self-care to you, then it's self-care. Journaling feels like self-care to you, it's self-care. Getting together your friends, Self-care is what makes you feel the most you. It reminds you of who you are because so much of parenting is, I don't remember who I am anymore or I'm becoming a whole different version of me and I don't, I don't know that new version of me and I kind of need to meet her. That's okay. That's what self-care is for. 
So I hope that clears up any confusion about the difference between anesthesia, self-maintenance, and self-care. If you have any questions about these categories, and I agree with you that they're a little fuzzy, right? Some things like edge at the edges of the category, they're a little bit self-maintenance and a little bit self-care. They're a little bit anesthesia and a little bit self-maintenance. They do blur at the edges, and that's okay. We don't have to sit. This is a very post-traumatic person kind of thing to want to sit and categorize things as exactly where they go. That's okay. As long as you know that anesthesia isn't self-care, anesthesia isn't self-maintenance, self-maintenance isn't self-care, you need all three and figure out a way to get them in your life, then you're good. If you like this episode, if this, if self-care has been something you've been thinking about a lot, if this was clarifying to you, or if I'm completely wrong, please let me know, comment below so we can have a dialogue and we can learn from each other. And of course, if you want to hang out where the post-traumatic parents hang out, check out at Dr. Kozlowitz Psychology on Instagram. And the post-traumatic parenting podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. Till next time.